And this is uh, the first chapter from that. To give you the, the full effect, I will read you the pithy epigrams as well, which are, Truth lies within a little uncertain compass, but error is immense, as said by Henry St. John, the Viscount Bolingbroke. It has been said that there are few situations in life which cannot be honorably settled, and without loss of time, either by suicide, a bag of gold, or by thrusting a despised antagonist over the edge of a precipice upon a dark night. <laughs> From Kai Lung's Golden Hours by Ernest Bramah. Chapter 1. Early Morning Itinerary. Arrival, Tour of the Courtyard, and Conditions of Hospitality. The sky over the grand barony of blessed Ashmere was like the haze over a stiffening corpse's eyes. The sunless chill of the early spring morning sucked warmth from exposed skin, and Loch Lamora's every joint and sinew felt as though they had been repeatedly kicked from four days of hard riding to get here. Look at this, he muttered, Ashmere the tepid, Ashmere the once proud, Ashmere the saddest sack of mule shit masquerading as a city that I have ever seen. Ashmere the opportunity, said John Tannen. Ashmere, the necessary evil. Ashmere, which was your fucking bright idea, you should remember. <laughs> Locke grunted and shifted in his saddle to maintain an even distribution of misery throughout his muscles. His vantage point was near the summit of the weathered, rune-dotted hills that hemmed the city in to its northeast. Far below, windmills turned lazily over a plain of polder fields bordered in the south by miles of wide embankments holding the gray-green sea in check. He's a fan. <laughs> Most of Ashmere proper was built atop those embankments, a vast crescent of brick and plaster neighborhoods now sagging with age. The city's taller buildings loomed over the misty polder plain like so many suicides waiting to step over the edge. Thirteen gods, said Locke, this place could not get invaded if they put whores and free beer at every single gate. <laughs> there were so many notes in the sad song of the tired old barony, thought Locke. Its mines were exhausted, it had no major eldren relics to draw scholars, its sea trade was anemic. It did sell a great many ship charters of convenience to pirates and smugglers, but even they rarely bothered calling here. Anywhere else in the world was more lucrative to pirate from or smuggle to. Ashmere's outlands had dissolved into clannish, self-reliant hamlets where unwary strangers were murdered for their clothes and horses rather than their money. Its only decent farmland was 15 feet below sea level and rapidly became marsh without constant attention to pumps, channels, and dikes. This laborious, inglorious self-preservation was the city's only major industry. The two gentlemen bastards, dressed like men of moderate wealth who'd slept in their clothes, were riding up the last stretch of gravel road to the Castabaru de Rajadesa, the splendid house of Rajadesa, fortress of the man who claimed mastery of this eminently sinkable city. What would truly be splendid, thought Locke, would be to catch sight of the place before his ass seceded from the rest of his body over half a week of uncustomary abuse. Next time Callow suggests that we book passage on a ship, he said, you remind me to fall to the ground and offer him a very respectful cock polishing. <laughs> Seasickness or saddle burns, said John. You had one or the other coming no matter how we got here. Besides, nobody that I ever heard of drowned on horseback. The ill-kept Theron Throne Road from Camor to Ashmere was a notorious breaker of wheels and axes, next to useless for carriages moving at any worthwhile speed. Locke and John had ridden in the middle with... Uh, ridden in, sorry. Who wrote this shit? <laughs> ridden in the saddle with a squad of hired guards, changing mounts at commercial relay stations, not quite with the speed of professional couriers, but fast and hard enough to leave them walking steadily more gingerly each night. After arrival this morning, they'd both been too irate to bother with hiring a carriage for full effect. They'd simply changed into their wrinkled finery, laid out too much gold for a pair of vaguely pretty mares that presumably did not eat human flesh, and meandered up the road into the northeastern hills toward the Baron's estate. Fortunately for Locke's posterior, there was a sign of progress around the very next bend. It was a checkpoint, a little wooden barracks house, and a set of blackened iron gates across the road. Four guards spread out before the gates, hands on sword hilts as Locke and John approached. Names, origins, and intentions, said the oldest of the four, showing them the palm of a gloved hand. Lasco Coltari and Jan de Sartana, merchants of Camor, here at the very kind and express invitation of Lord Raja Dessa. Locke had their entry pass, which was scented parchment with cloth, of, with cloth of silver pressed onto the borders, no less, ready to hand over. He waved it before him. As for our intentions, well, he pointed to himself and John, as I said, we're merchants. The senior guard stared at them, saying nothing. We're here for the auction, prompted John. The guard moved his lower jaw from left to right several times as though some bothersome scrap of food was trapped behind his gums, but he remained silent. 
The auction, said Locke. The Baron's auction? We intend to buy things there? By express written invitation? Still the guard said nothing, and now scowled openly at Locke as though he recognized the perpetrator of some past crime. See here. Locke stiffened his posture in the saddle and used his abundant supply of aches to kindle the fires of indignation. How plainly must I speak? Your master has invited us here for the purpose of giving him large amounts of money. Why are you impeding us? You wish, said the guard slowly, entry to the residence of his lordship, correct? Obviously, said Locke through gritted teeth. And you say you've come all the way from Camor. I have said, and we have. You must be rather sore from the journey. You know, I only thought I was sore until I began this conversation. Are you? <laughs> a sudden thought pierced the veil of Locke's irritation. Was the old bastard holding out for a bribe? Locke adopted an air of oily joviality. Say, it's pretty lonely out here. Lonely duty. Hard, too, I'd wager. Not particularly, said the guard. Not many comforts or rewards, eh? Jean gave his waistcoat pocket an obvious pat as he spoke up, and Locke silently blessed him for picking up on his lead. For standing up at this lonely, boring gate all day, huh? Oh, we're quite adequately provided for, sir, said the guard. <laughs> well, that's splendid, said Locke. God damn the man with pox of the prick. No professional guardsman <laughs> with half the wits of a boiled radish could have possibly missed such hints. Look here. Damn it all, the Baron himself invited us. This is Theron coming out of my mouth, right? Right? Do you have an invitation, sir? Locke's right eyeball twitched of its own accord. <laughs> we do. We do indeed, he said, waving the scented scroll before him. As previously alluded to, without subtlety. <laughs> that is a fine piece of rolled parchment, said the guard. And it is merely a rolled piece of parchment until and unless it is properly examined. Are we in any danger of having it properly examined, said Locke, <laughs> wondering how far he could safely push four armed men. He decided that if they weren't attacking him just yet, it was probably acceptable to be a jackass. Are you <laughs> properly trained to unroll a scroll, or will you need to send for some sort of expert? <laughs> I may, in fact, be able to handle this myself, said the guard. He took the scroll at last, and slowly, ever so slowly, he unrolled it. He then peered at the invitation as though his eyesight had worsened substantially between this sentence and the last. <laughs> Nothing else happened for at least a minute. Locke's horse snorted with something that sounded close to disdain, and Locke stroked her neck while shifting uneasily in his saddle. Why the hell was this idiot detaining them? Locke glanced around furtively. No ambush appeared to be lurking in the nearby trees. As the senior guard actually began to sniff at the parchment, Locke turned his scrutiny to the man and his fellows. All the guards wore brass-studded leather armor and tunics of Ashmere's heraldic pale green. Their swords had decorative scabbards, but the hilts bore the worn look of constant practice rather than ceremonial cleanliness. Interesting. There was money sunk into that gear, and whoever commanded these men was pragmatic enough to keep them ready to use it. Why would a healthy force of arms keep a parchment-sniffing twit on the payroll? <laughs> Ahem, said Locke at last. Begging your pardon, but you have examined that damn thing long enough to have written it. You can read, can't you? I can read very well, sir. Then what mystery, pray tell, so commands your attention? There's no mystery at all, sir. Perhaps another five to ten minutes of verification should be sufficient. For what? If you can indeed read, you already know that the document is a formal invitation from your lord and master, and it bears our names over his seal. We are his guests. He is our host. I don't care if you take the parchment behind the bushes, drop your breeches, screw it until the ink's rubbed off, but before you do, just open the bloody gate. Master Coltari, said John. If you do not, shouted Locke, no longer certain that he was at all in character. I will require you to tender a personal explanation for our absence to your host. I will take the greatest pleasure in listening to you describe why you did not see fit to allow the several thousand Ashmiri royals we carry to join the Baron's personal fortune. Sir, your saddlebags are not of sufficient size to carry several thousand letters of credit you get. Do I have to draw small pictures for you in the gravel? I would not so wish to trouble you, sir, said the guard, signing the thing. Indeed, I am forced to pronounce your credentials both genuine and sufficient. Indeed you are, said Locke. And now will you... The senior guard gestured to his three fellows who unlocked the black iron barriers and drew them apart. 
Thank you, said Locke, urging his horse forward. I will treasure the memory of this interlude, and I am certain that the Baron will be most interested to hear about it. Sir, said one of the younger guards quite sharply, sir, don't say anything bad about the oranges. About the what? He's right, said the senior guard, fixing Locke with an intense stare. He handed the invitation back as Locke rode past. Don't say anything bad concerning the oranges. You are very, very fond of them if you know what's good for you. <laughs> Why would I come all this way just to insult somebody's oranges, said Locke. You wouldn't, said the senior guard. His voice was cold and firm. You wouldn't if you were wise. <clears throat> ah, welcome to the Castavaru de Rajadesa, said the guard, sweeping the gates firmly closed between himself and the two thieves. The lock mechanisms engaged with a well-oiled clang. It's not far now. Stay on the path. Admire the oranges. <laughs> He turned away before Locke or Jean could say anything else.